ladies and gentlemen, uh, I welcome you to our third panel today on the second day of the Berlin Demography Days 2024. My name is Ronja Bachhofer. I'm a journalist from Germany and I will be guiding you through the discussion today. First of all, if you have any questions or comments, there is a Q&A function. It's the symbol with the two speech bubbles at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to write your questions there at any time and I will bring them into the, the discussion. Um, we will have the panel in English, but for those who would like to listen to it in German, there's an interpretation. You can switch to either English or German by clicking on that little globe symbol at the bottom of your screen. Yes, today we want to talk about healthcare in a time of demographic change. Our society is getting older, that's clear. And my parents who were born in the baby boomer generation, they had to fight for jobs. And my father still tells me today how the professor in his first lecture told him that only half of the people in his class will get a job later. And my generation hardly knows this problem, but at the same time is facing another problem because there's too much work and too few people to do it. And we have not even reached the peak yet. Many will only retire in the coming years. Too many to replace them with young people for now. And in addition, people are reaching an increasingly higher age, which is good news, of course, but we also need younger people to look after the elderly. So how do we cope with demographic change? How do we ensure that people are well cared for in their old years? How can they continue to participate in social life? We want to discuss these and other questions today, but not me alone, uh, but together with four experts. And I want to uh, briefly introduce them to you now. Um, Jane C. Falkingham is Professor of Demography and International Social Policy. Vice President of the University of Southampton and Director of the ESRC Center for Population Change. And she's been re researching aging, health and generations for many years. Tiago Eric Dessa is a technical officer for age-friendly environments at the WHO, so the World Health Organization. And age-friendly cities and communities can improve access to important services and support healthy aging through different measures that um, he might explain to us later on. Adam Rogalewski is policy officer for health and social services in the European Federation of Public Service Unions. And he represents European organized civil society in the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, where he also drafted the first EU policy paper on home care workers. And last but not least, Daniele Vignoli is Professor of Demography at the University of Florence. He's currently the scientific coordinator of the project AGED, Aging Well in an Aging Society. And he's investigating demographic changes regarding the aging process of the healthcare workforce. And in this context is also looking at the role of migration in the healthcare sector. Um, yet yeah, I looked it up uh, before, the average woman in Germany has 1.36 children. And this is one reason why there are fewer and fewer young people. And I would like to ask you, Mrs. Falkingham, maybe for this to start with, um, what are other reasons? We cannot hear you yet. I'm not sure. Probably. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Could, could could you uh, repeat your repeat your question? Yeah. So so one reason why there are fewer young people is um, that I looked at in Germany, it's one point three six children per uh, woman. But I guess there are also other reasons. 
Oh, in yeah. Okay, so thinking about the availability of, of family to provide care, I, I think is what you're you're getting at. Yes, and certainly, yes. I, so I I have to confess, I'm the baby boom generation that you were talking about. And and in the UK, one in five of the women who were born in the 1960s actually have no children. So it's not just the average that we need to look at. We need to look at the distribution. So there are still uh, people who have three or four children, but equally we have a growing number of people who who are childless. So that's, that's something that we need to bear in mind. But we also need to think about economic and social change as well. So um, uh, more and more of adult children are, are living further away from their parents than they might have done in the past. So we've got uh, increasing geographic mobility and we also have more women working than we had in the past. Um, that's not to say that adult sons do not take care of their parents, uh, but primarily uh, the, the burden of particularly of personal care tasks falls to women. So if we look at the gender division of, of caring for older parents, um, sons tend to do, come and do the gardening and do the physical tasks around and, and perhaps also manage the finances, whereas it would be the daughters who are actually providing the more intimate personal care tasks. And because more people are working, and particularly more women are working, then you've got a decline in the availability of adult children to provide care. So that is something that is changing. Definitely and changing. More, more women are working, of course, but um, the garden work. <laughs> well, more women, more been... women are, are economically um, active, and and also that they are, uh, and more people live geographically distant from from their parents' generation. So if we're thinking about uh, the ability to rely on adult children to provide informal care in later life, then there are um, uh, increasing pressures on, on adult children. And also, if we think about the changing life course, those adult children uh, are now providing care to parents. I'm providing care to my mother. She's in her 80s. I just had a big birthday, actually. I, I just had a birthday with a six at the beginning of it. And um, that means that um, actually there are grandchildren also to provide care for. So in terms of sandwich generations, with there are lots of competing demands, lots of um, economic and social roles that people are having to occupy simultaneously. And one, uh, the, some of the work that we've been doing in Southampton has been looking at um, the ability of people to combine work and, and, pair, and, and caring. And what we found is that um, people can provide care up to a certain level in their 50s, but once it becomes more intensive, people actually then face uh, the, the decision, do I continue providing care or do I continue to work? And people are actually exiting the labor market. So we found that, that people in their 50s, particularly women in their 50s, when faced with intensive caring, we're actually making the decision to withdraw from the labor market, which means that employers are losing access to an, a talented pool of people. Mm -hmm. I see. So so families and also jobs are, are changing. Um, what does the fact that people are getting older mean for the healthcare system? Maybe that's a question for uh, Mr. Vignoli. Yes, sure. Yes, actually, we live in a world with an overall shortage of healthcare workers because of at least uh, two reasons. The population growth in the global south and the population aging in the global north. And actually, from an European perspective here, the key challenge is population aging. But um, let me address this from a from a general demographic perspective, let me put aging and the aging of the health workforce within a broad demographic uh, perspective. Scientific ideas on uh, human population tend to be rooted in a slow demography paradigm in which we are used to think about an inertial, self-contained and predictable view on population dynamics. 
but is also true that essentially linked to mortality and fertility. But it is also true that demography can also move fast if in addition to uh, to, to fertility and mortality, we also take into account migration. Let me take uh, uh, Italy uh, as an example. Italy, my country. Italy is, in demographic terms, an exceptional country. If you uh, search for Italy in any international rankings, Italy always scores uh, on the first uh, uh, on the first position uh, is uh, really always first in the rankings. Uh, we have a tremendously low fertility, one of the highest life expectancy in the world, latest late transition to adult to adulthood, and fast uh, migratory uh, movements. And because of all these extreme values, Italy is leading global aging. So from this perspective, this position of Italy as a front runner of aging makes Italy an ideal empirical laboratory to address the consequences and the challenges of aging. So from this point of view, when designing policies about the healthcare system in the face of a demographic change, as in Italy, but in many other countries, more emphasis, I think, needs to be devoted to migratory movements. View and we have to be very clear on that, also population aging from a replacement migration perspective. The intergenerational mobility of health workers is increasing. Future projections point to a progressive acceleration in international migration with a weakening of the traditional source and destination countries. So I just uh, want to emphasize that a more clear attention to migration uh, will help to transform aging and the aging of the health workforce from a challenge or a problem, as it is often perceived, into an opportunity. So fast demography pushed by migration um, is less inertial than slow demography, and it matters a lot. See, and is migration also um, how Italy deals uh, with this uh, shortage of healthcare workers or what other um, ideas are there in Italy? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, generally speaking, uh, um, when uh, um, empirical uh, data are sparse, and when empirical data is sparse, like uh, it is the case of uh, Italy, demographic methods are often very essential, uh, especially to estimate entry and exit uh, to a population. And what we are actually discussing in Italy is uh, if we are not considering migration, so the, the key point is we need to bring migration into the discussion. Without considering migration, uh, the point is that uh, as health workers approach retirement, adequate numbers of new potential healthcare workers needs to be educated, recruited, and retained. And a key issue is also uh, we need to minimize early retirements by uh, reinvesting in major health workers via supportive policies and practices. So really, we need specific guidelines to have a smooth, uh, a smooth, a, a, a smooth transition to retirement and also minimize early retirement. This is what we are actually discussing. But but we really need to also bring the idea of migration. Otherwise, it, it does not only it does not work. I see. Thank you, um, Mr. Rogaleski. Among other things, you also deal with the work of employees in home care. Uh, what is changing at the moment for this group of workers? Because I imagine the work is really stressful, um, and is that always getting worse? Yes, you could hear me now. Uh, I mean, yeah, the situation of the of the workforce uh, in the care homes is, I would say, tragical after the, <clears throat> in particular after the COVID pandemic, where we see that um, the work has become very uh, intensive. There is the shortage of the of the of the of the workforce, uh, so there is not enough uh, personnel uh, at the care homes. Uh, there was cases in particular in during the night shift that there's one nurse responsible for 20 or 30 care recipients. And in, in relation to that, uh, I think we, we really observe the situation whereby uh, very, very few people want to uh, be uh, 
a career I talk uh, recently to our colleagues from from Germany from Verdi members and uh, one of the uh, care workers was telling me that uh, she has a kids and she doesn't want her kids to be a, a care worker no because it's not giving any satisfactions uh, anymore uh, because of the increasing uh, staff shortages and when we talk about staff shortages so we need to really look at this from the holistic perspective so it's not only about i would say <clears throat> wages although they are extremely important but the average wages of nurses or care workers are sometimes lower the wages of care workers are sometimes lower than overage wages in some uh, countries, but it's also in general about the working conditions. Now we have a situation in terms of mental health, so psychosocial factors, but we also, and this is really increased as a result of the pandemic, uh, more and more violence against the healthcare workforce. We call it uh, third party violence because we see that if there is, you know, you cannot deliver quality care, and if you cannot deliver quality care, the patients and also the families are become very upset and you know they, they complain or in some cases uh, being uh, very aggressive. So I think here is this all of the issues which are very much related to the situation of the care workers because, and this is important to highlight, care sector was neglected for a long time. Uh, in a particular in the UK, it's a very good example now that the mm -hmm. local authorities are responsible for the um, long term care, whereas for the health is NHS. And you could see that as a result of that, a lot of uh, local authorities got bankrupt because they couldn't uh, provide uh, uh, care homes. So I think here's the, the situation that's, uh, um, that if we don't change it, uh, then we will see uh, a really dreadful. Um, background of, of the care homes where by no one from the local population would be interested in working there. And adding to that, we also need to uh, have the discussion about migration as Daniela was saying about we need to have migrants. That's okay. Of course, we need to have migrants, but quite ethical discussions here. But why we want migrants to suffer exploitation on very bad working conditions that they are now no i mean this is really not fair to uh to feel the staff shortages in a care home by inviting people coming from other countries this is not really uh, sustainable and this is not really possible so i think here we really need to address this and uh, maybe i could also add the situation about the uh, the workforce getting older as well, no? And when you get older, you have an uh, increased uh, risk of having other uh, illnesses. Uh, we know that, for instance, in the healthcare sector, the biggest problems are musculoskeletal disorders. So, you know, when the problems with your back and if your muscles. So I think that's, that's again, adding to the situation that we need to uh, have a good working conditions, including uh, wages, but also health uh, and safety uh, regulations uh, in uh, in place. Uh, and we need to have the discussion how we could address uh, other staff shortages. There are some positive examples on the European level. Last year, the Commission, the European Commission adopted the European case strategy. And there are some uh, objectives how to improve the situation there. And each of the countries need to um, have a designated person who will be contacting the European Commission to say if there is any, any policies in place in order to, to ensure that we have quality access to, uh, to healthcare. So maybe that's all from, from the beginning from my side as a contribution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question, I, I think it's uh, for you in the Q&A. It's, um, are there any differences between the urbanic areas to the rural areas? And uh, I think it's about the the conditions, working conditions for healthcare workers. Oh, yeah. So because we could also start talking about the so-called health deserts now. So it's not like uh, we have some problems with uh, personnel in the big uh, care homes or hospitals. We have an issues with uh, someone we have issues at uh, there's not enough people in in smaller 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 cities because no one really wants to to work uh, there 
Uh, there was a case, I think, in, in Lithuania, they, they closed one couple of mental health hospitals because, you know, they were too small and no one wants to, wants to, wants to work there. So that's, that's the problem, that it's not only about dealing with the health uh, staff shortages in the bigger cities, but in the smaller cities as well. And I think you in Germany, you have these problems as well. Now there's discussions about we will be closing down hospitals and going to a bigger one. But the question means that people will have limited access to the to the health and social care. And this is actually against the principle of colleagues from WHO will be saying now about the universal access to health. So I think that's, a, that's, that's an issue we need to address. There are some positive aspects. I think in Sweden, the, the, the government is paying extra money for some workers who wants to work in, you know, uh, rural areas which are located far away from the from the from the big cities. So yeah, this is this is a uh, health deserts adding deserts adding uh, even more problems for delivering. Care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can believe that also elderly people uh, suffer under the conditions of uh, healthcare workers. Um, and maybe one solution um, are the age-friendly environments um, that uh, Mr. Desa is concerned with. Can you probably uh, briefly introduce us? Um, yeah, what 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 are age-friendly environments? What are they about, and why are they necessary? Of course, I can run in many thanks for the invitation and for the colleagues that are part of the panel. But before I go there, I just saw that uh, Professor Falkenham had uh, her hand raised. So I just wanted to double check whether she would like to come in before I address uh, your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I was just really reflecting on, on Adam and Danielle's um, comments and just I think both of their their, their um, responses just highlight how complicated this whole picture is. So um, I think we we do need to have a, a, a national and an international debate around how we take care of our older people and how we value care work. Because I think that's what Adam is really saying. It, it, you know, the wages in in the, the informal or the formal care sector are, are very very low. You know, our parents or our spouse or our lifelong partner or ourself uh, are the are valued members of society and valued members of our families. And yet we're not paying um, adequate wages and, and recognizing uh, that sector. So I think that that is a really valid point that Adam raises. And then Danielle um, mentioned migration. And of course, many of uh, our, our countries are, are relying on migrant workforce in, in the, the care sector. Um, but that is then taking away workers from the other end of the chain. And so there is actually some really interesting work on on um, on chains of care migration. So, for example, in the UK, a lot of work in, in uh, care homes up until um, Brexit uh, was carried out by workers from other European Union countries, particularly Romania uh, and uh, A8 countries, which were then leaving gaps in their care sectors and their care were then being filled by migrants from Central Asia. And, and then who's filling the gap in Central Asia? So this is a global, we have global aging. So although migration can be part of the solution in one country, it's actually, if we take a global perspective, I think migration um, has as many problems as it has solutions. So sorry, I just wanted to come, but I'm really interested in age-friendly environments. So thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think that it was a, a very nice uh, a, a introduction to my comment as well, because uh, I would like perhaps to share some good news, right? That even though we have a lot of challenges that result from an amazing victory of humankind, which is the fact that we are living longer lives, but this is a success for us to celebrate. Now, the challenge is for us to add life to those extra years because we we don't want it just to live more. We want to live well, fulfilling lives. You know? So if if those that are not in the second half of life uh, uh, are lucky enough, then you know, we want to make sure that those additional decades, hopefully in life, are lived to the fullest. 
And of course, uh, one very important aspect here is to make all the people, as Professor Falkenham mentioned, more valued and more visible. And if I may just come into that discussion in particular, we know that a lot of the formal and informal care is provided by other people themselves. And this is oftentimes invisible in the debate and the discussion, the importance of that population group in caring for others. Uh, we've seen also, and this is a concrete example we saw across age-friendly cities and communities on how important all the people were in the response to the COVID crisis, for instance, or more recently in the response to the Ukrainian crisis uh, in many, many age-friendly cities and communities, uh, including also in neighboring countries such as Poland. And that story is not necessarily told right? because it is also true that all the people in those situations are the ones hit the hardest. Now, it is a global issue, but the good news is that we also have a global movement and a global platform we can build on. Uh, Ron has just mentioned age-friendly environments, which is the area I am responsible for here at WHO. And that uh, very much concerns everything that needs to be done in the environment to enable people to live healthy, fulfilling lives for as long as possible in a place that is right for them. And when we talk about environments here, we're talking about basically everything that is outside of yourself. So we're talking about the physical environments, the households, the outdoor spaces, the transport systems you have next to you or you don't have next to you, we just mentioned the services that you have around, and Adam has just mentioned the health deserts, oftentimes in rural areas, but also in many cases in you know, uh, parts of urban areas as well, uh, the services we have available to ourselves, but also the, the people, the culture, the beliefs that we have around us. We know, for instance, that a very important aspect to create age-friendly environments is to tackle ageism, uh, including ageism in health and social care, including the self-directed ageism that oftentimes has a major barrier for people to seek care in the first place. So there's a lot in there, and there's a global movement trying to come up with some of those solutions. In the end, societies are changing, and they are changing really fast. Yeah, and they're changing even faster in low and middle income countries. And I think that this uh, poses us a, a, an immense opportunity for us to reinvent the societies for the future we want to live in. And that's what age-friendly cities and communities are all about. Uh, for those that are less familiar with this, uh, just a, a quick background. Back in 2006, uh, WHO has done a global consultation with all the people to understand what an age-friendly environment would mean to them. And they've identified eight domains of action where we should intervene to make sure that yes, people get the health and the social care they need when they need, but also for us to prevent people from uh, having to have health and social care in the first place. So here we are talking about housing, transportation, outdoor spaces, community support, communication, information and technology, social participation, social inclusion, employment and education. So there's a wide range of domains where we should intervene to create age-friendly environments, just so that people live you know, the lives they want to live. They can you know, live and enjoy in the places they would like to live. And that's basically what every single age-friendly city and community in our global network is trying to do. Uh, they are addressing uh, those topics. And at now we have uh, 1, over 1,550 cities and communities. Pleased to say that we have three in Germany. It's a growing number. We have many more in many other countries. And these cities and communities also rural, remote, indigenous communities in over 50 countries from around the world, they're really trying to come up with those solutions, now addressing, uh, implementing interventions in all these domains. But most importantly, 
And I think that this is really important. And I would like to end my first intervention here with that message. And now, uh, for of anything that I tell today, I would really like you to stick to that message. Most important than having older people as beneficiaries of whatever we do or don't do on those environments, all the people need to be agents of that transformation. We need to put the mechanisms and the systems in place for all the people to be engaged in the transformation of their communities. And this is what age-friendly citizen communities are doing from around the world, from assessing the situation, identifying the priorities, adapting the solutions to their specific context, whether it's a large city, a rural community, an indigenous community, to then evaluating what has been done and then rerunning this whole cycle again. And I think that this is really important because ultimately we don't want to develop uh, societies for this and the future generations of older people for them. We need to do it together. We need to do it with them, with the meaningful engagement of older people throughout this whole process. Mm -hmm, I see. Um, you still need uh, people working for transportation and health and and all those subjects you mentioned, um, also in these in these um, age friendly cities, right? Or or are elderly people um, included and and care for each other? <laughs> Oh, definitely. And, 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 and if we are successful in creating environments that foster the abilities of all the people, that foster a healthy aging throughout the life course, then ultimately people will arrive at the end of their lives uh, much more able and capable to continue to do the things they want to do or to change their course in life, to perhaps you know, go back to school or take up on a new job, do things that matter for them. The problem today is that we, in most places around the world, uh, we do not have environments that are conducive for that. So again, we are in a way, you know, in, a, in a dare need to reinvent the societies we live in because the demographic change you know, together with urbanization, with climate change, and many other major global trends are completely reshaping the way we organize ourselves. Now, we may not have all the solutions today, but we have a number of solutions being tested, experimented across the globe, many of which led by age-friendly citizen communities, which we can try and use and replicate, adapt and learn, see what works, what doesn't. Uh, ultimately, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to put Professor Falkenheims on, 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 on the spot here, but she mentioned that she just turned 60. Well, probably 50 years ago, right? she, she would be like at the very end of her life, most likely, right? in that cohort. Today, she is a very active, fully functional professor taking care of children, taking care of her parents. So that's the new reality. And this is amazing. Now, we need to make sure that more and more we have environments that enable people to continue doing the things that they value. Uh, they, do their employer are age-friendly enough to enable them to continue doing this? Do their neighborhoods are conducive to a healthy aging life? Now, do we have the services and systems in place that will allow people to continue to live those fulfilling lives? Do people around us perceive all the people positively or no? Or they have negative views and attitudes towards them? Do we have a health system that understands the heterogeneity now, within that population group? Because there's a huge heterogeneity. I mean, we're talking about people from 60 to 110 years old. So there are all these elements that are relevant for us when we talk about creating cities, communities, environments that are, that are age friendly. Okay, um, we have two more questions in the chat already. Um, one is, um, I, I guess it's for everyone. Um, how can sociology help us? 
Does anyone feel um, ready to answer this question? Yes, Mrs. Falkingham. Or Mr. Vignoli. <laughs> Maybe so, one after another. Well, in, 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 in America, no, no, no. actually, um, demography is, is viewed as almost a branch of sociology. So um, sociology absolutely can help us. I mean, sociology is, is the understanding of society. And I think everything that uh, we've just been talking about uh, in terms of age-friendly communities uh, is all about understanding society. So so yes, uh, sociology can help us. Just on these age-friendly societies, I mean, a piece of work that has been done by some colleagues of mine in the Center for Population Change based at St. Andrews University has actually been looking at um, uh, age segregation. And one of the, uh, the alarming things I think that they found is actually we've become a much more age-segregated society. So that means the different age groups are not living together and um and i think that i mean there's some very interesting trial projects now around trying to bring the different generations together and to get um intergenerational living i don't necessarily mean that the generations are living together in the same household but intergenerational living across communities and um, sharing perhaps of, of child care and elder care facilities involving older people in the, the, the care of, of younger people. And that uh, intergenerational transmission of views and values and, and, and beliefs and learning in both directions. I mean, we saw that in, in COVID actually, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot more intergenerational discussions and transfers. And, and uh, we saw grandparents suddenly becoming very um, able to use things like smartphones and, and and becoming more digitally aware. So this is a fantastic discussion. Um, and I'm hoping the next 10 to 15 years, we're gonna see lots and lots of progress in this because I am, I am 60, but 60 is the new 50. Um, I, I have a question because you just men uh, mentioned generations um, because I often, have the feeling that generations have very different worldviews and and sometimes simply don't understand each other. Um, do you share this, or um, what would you say? How do generations look after each other? I think Adam has his hand up before I I jump into that. Oh, all right. Yeah, and also Mr. Vignoli wanted to add something oh. before. <laughs> <laughs> but now first, Mr. Rogalewski. No, I think Daniela wants to take the floor in terms of sociology, and then I could actually add something from the perspective okay, of industrial relations. So maybe just let's, let's okay. do it. Yes, of course. I was uh, thinking that, um, no, first of all, I really like this uh, positive view on population aging in the sense that uh, we are researchers, so we need to find solutions and we need to be uh, proactive. So the way we need to address aging is really in a proactive and positive way to transform it into an opportunity eh, for the inclusiveness of our society across all ages. And uh, regarding the question on sociology, I was thinking about a key demographic demographic uh, dimension that has huge sociological implication that is gender that needs to be taken into account when we think about the future of our health work uh, force where gender uh, disaggregated data are available they really tend to show that health occupation are highly uh, gendered and uh, um, from a demographic perspective what I think is that these gender stereotypes are a constraint to men to enter a female dominated professions like uh, care there are some cultural expectations that uh, women need to care about the elderly which are totally uh, challenged by the uh, actual uh, situation and also women entering into male dominated professions and these kind of gender stereotypes are reducing the pool of potential recruits. And in a world with an overall shortage of health workers, this is just a, 
uh, significant waste of uh, resources. So we really need to think about how to address also gender equality into the healthcare system. And I think this is demography and also sociology. Uh, usually we think about demography as a cross discipline. We don't need only a discipline, we just need a transdisciplinary approaches here. Yeah, very interesting point. Thank you for that. And, and now, Mr. Rogalewski, please. Yes, I just want to add it from maybe my field, because I did a PhD in industrial relations. I think we really need to focus on, on the on the, on the work, how we work, and if that's very, very important for us, because we are still at work now. We work longer, uh, also we work in different places. Some of us are working from home. But I think this is extremely important to uh, how to tackle the issues of of uh, of demographic change and and all um, aging of the population, we need to increase work life balance. Now that that's the issue. So if you have more work life balance, then we could actually look after our elderly population. We could look after our kids or our our parents. That's one issue. And we already have some examples of uh, how to improve work life balance. That's what we are discussing as a trade unions with employers. How we could make the profession more attractive, no? Because uh, the problem in in the health is that you know you, we work shifts, so we cannot really work maybe part time or a couple of hours there and there. But I think work life balance is is important uh, here. Also, I agree with Daniela in terms of the gender issue, and this is the reason I believe that the care is not valued by our society, but more importantly by our government, because. We could talk here about how great it, about our plans, how great it will be, the aging uh, aging uh, projects by colleagues from the WHO. But if we don't have money, that we can do anything. And I think it's a really important decision for the for the governments where they want to spend money and when they really want to invest in care. Because we, as a trade unions, we are saying that this is not spending, this is actually investments in health and social care. And this discussion, I think it's crucial because we already see that after the money we spend during the COVID pandemic to support our economies, we need to do some, there will be some austerity measures. Now there is discussion in Germany about that. There will be discussion on the European Union level. And I think we need to really ensure that the budget for health and social care is excluded. That means that we need to have money to spend or rather say to invest in health and care society. Because, you know, without money, it's all about the dreams. You know, we want to look after each other and support each other. But honestly, we need to have money. We need to have money to build uh, care homes or renovate the care homes now because there will be another issue probably of climate change. It will be too hot. There is not enough. I, I in conditioning and so on so forth. So we need to have really money to spend on that. And when it comes to how we are looking after each other, I think we need to have more democracy. And I think when we have uh, community work, so democracy on the community level, but also democracy at the workplaces, and this is why the trade unions are, to have the works council or trade union representations, and that we could deliver a lot. We are luckily on the European level, we have a social dialogue with employers' organizations from Germany, but also NHS still. And we have some, we develop some uh, proposals in terms of how to address staff shortages. But for us, it's extremely important to address the retention of the healthcare workforce. And I think here, uh, when we have this debate about health, we should really not forget about the the um, the, the workplaces, the world of work, because uh, it's everywhere. And luckily, on that level, we have a legislation in relation to occupational health and safety, because this is which is related to you know, European Union has competences, and we could develop a lot. So. Maybe I just want to add one of our proposals is to have a special direct directive on on mental health, which will help to uh, address the issues relating to protections from our health. But my comment is also, uh, because we have a discussion here, right, so, uh, to, to Daniela, this idea about migration, and, and Jane was saying about this global chain of migration, now we know that migrants women are exploited uh, from coming from Philippines to the UK, they work there, so there's no one who looks after workers in Philippines. And, and I really think that we will not solve the issues 
of staff shortages by migration, because if you look globally on that, the societies are getting older. I mean, even the Chinese societies are getting older. I'm not really demographic. I think the only continent which is growing is, is Africa now. So I think it's not really sustainable to rely on Filipino workers coming to Europe. And and because that's good that they are coming because it's you know it's good because they contribute to our society it's about diversity but we should really protect those communities from sort of brain drain no and ensure that you know we are not uh, taking the workers from outside who are being educated by by the manner of their fellow citizens so i think that the question is here is it really like we could rely on migration because i don't think globally uh, only africa has a positive no uh, um, child care rates. So that's my question here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Mr. Vignoli, would you like to respond to that? Yes, sure. Uh, my um, example on migration was strongly focused on the Italian case. I totally agree that uh, if we address the issue globally, migration is not the solution and demographic forces uh, need to always take into account fertility, mortality and migration. My point is that if you focus on Italy and you think that Italy is isolated with respect to the rest of the world, it doesn't work. Italy cannot uh, um, address population aging only thanks to fertility and mortality, we also need to take into account migration. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't work. But the population aging is not only about the elderly. Aging is a demographic process. Aging is also about the loss of young adults, uh, show, uh, is about declining fertility. And in Italy, since we have declining fertility since the 70s, we now have a reduced pool of uh, potential parents. So there is not only the issue of how many children on average we are having in Italy, is that also we have fewer parents having children and the lost parents cannot be recovered anymore can, uh, unless we uh, allow migration to enter the country. So I think that the demographic process is global. If we take into account our perspective from some European societies like Italy with our government, we have to be very clear that to address aging is not only about fertility and family. And I'm a, I ferti I'm a fertility researcher, so I work a lot on um, work-life balance, how this uh, improves uh, well-being and how this improves uh, the possibility of having the desired number of children. But from a general population perspective, we also need to take into account that demography can also move fast thanks to migration. So thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking. Um, like I, I would be very interested in your uh, opinion about AI or or robots or um anything like that like would would this be a real alternative as we have a shortage of of humans who who can take care for elderly people yeah a really interesting question and actually um there is a a, a project going on right now in in hampshire which is um in the south of of england just close to southampton where um they're working with care bots so Hampshire County Council, I think, has um, bought 20 care bots and are putting them in their care homes and doing an evaluation on, on how these are working. And actually, um, they're working pretty well, but they're not an alternative to people. They're a supplement to people. Um, and so I think, yes, AI, yes, uh, uh, technology can it can improve uh, the quality of, of healthcare and the quality of, of social care. Um, it can improve the quality of work as well. I think Adam was talking about um, healthcare workers and musculoskeletal uh, issues. Well, actually, you know, 50 years ago, you didn't have all of the technology, and and so nurses we used to have to lift people out of bed. Now you don't ha you don't do that. You know the, there's all sorts of technology uh, um, that can be used. So I think technology is definitely part of the solution, but it's not an alternative. It's a, it's an enhancement, is my view. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe mm -hmm. I think Tiago wants to take the floor. He has the the hands. Tiago, right or not? 
Thanks, Adam. Yes, maybe just very quickly on the AI. There's a lot of potential on technology in general. Uh, I invite the colleagues to have a look at the global database of age-friendly practices where you will see how not just AI, but technology in general is being applied to try and address social isolation and loneliness to improve uh, the way uh, health and social care is provided. But I would like to echo Professor Falkenham's point that you know, all those technical technological solutions, they, they may help and we need evidence, way more evidence on a lot of those initiatives. They may also cause harm. So we have to be attentive to that. And when it comes to AI specifically, a risk that is elaborated in one of the uh, pieces, briefs of the connection series for the UN Decade of Healthy Aging is that we know that a lot of the data that is used to develop some of those AIs are biased. So we also have to be very attentive on uh, which biases we are you know, uh, including in some of those developments, be conscious of that and make sure that we involve all the people in the development of AI. We have a very concrete example from the colleagues from the Western Pacific, working with other people to develop a, an avatar to support on, on healthcare. So more of those examples, not joint development, joint design with other people is really important. Just two quick points on my side uh, in the previous points. One, to echo what uh, Adam has mentioned, money, and I would even go beyond resources are really important. And we've seen this in the global network, for example, because in some countries, in some regions, we have national and subnational programs supporting these communities with the technical expertise, with funds, with people, and that really makes a difference. Now, there are certain things that only local authorities can do, and there are certain things that only the national level can do. And of course, these attributions will change depending on where you are, but ultimately, you need a system and you need to make sure that every single layer of that system is properly funded and financed. Uh, and then I would encourage in the same global database, uh, you to have a look of the amazing initiatives around age-friendly employment, including in the health sector and age-friendly lifelong learning. So a lot of people after retirement, they want to do something else. They want to study, they want to pursue another career. And we need to you know, enable them to be able to do so. Last point from my side, intergenerational contacts is one of the three evidence-based solutions to combat ageism. The other ones are policy and law and educational campaigns. So it's really important that more and more we foster these types of contacts. This needs to be planned properly. Otherwise, again, you may cause harm. Uh, we've just developed a guide called Connecting Generations to help people planning and implementing intergenerational activities. And here, it's really important for us to change the mindset because oftentimes when we talk about intergenerational contacts, we think about an older person, 60 plus, and, and the younger person, a teenager. But yesterday I was having a conversation with uh, one of our age-friendly communities and they were reporting that actually people wanted to have intergenerational contacts between like uh, people 60 years or more and people of uh, 40 years or more. Those are also different generations. They come with a different background. So intergenerational contacts spam across all the generations from, um, from five to 105. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rugalewski, you're raising your hand. Yes, because I, when I always participate in those meetings about the staff shortages in the healthcare sector, they always, those two issues came, came up. One is about migration, that we need to recruit more migrants, which is true. And another is about artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think uh, they are not the solution to this, uh, to this situation, because I think, as, as already Jane was saying, no, the artificial intelligence is here to as, as a tool to support the workers uh, in their work, and we are using this more and more, but they cannot replace uh, uh, the workers. I mean, they cannot replace the carers because this is a particular aspect of this job. It's like a person is looking after a person. We cannot really replace this by the, by the robot. And luckily, I think in this sector, we cannot outsource care. No, it's not like a banking sector or that we could actually outsource this to, 
other countries from west uh, to east. So I think here is an important issue to underline that although artificial intelligence is there, there will be robots probably supporting uh, workers, but people need to be always in in charge of that. And, and, and to ensure that we're not shifting these discussions about we need to have you know robots and migrants because that will address the issues. I think what we are missing here, and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big discussion, is about how we could make sure that the work in the health and social care is attractive and is being sustainable. Because it's also, again, this debate is not that we have uh, staff shortages across all of the occupations. Some occupations have too many workers. You know, I mean, the problem is we have too many lawyers. I mean, I'm being myself, no? And why do we need lawyers? It could really replace very soon notary or solicitor by the computer, probably be doing this quicker, faster, and cheaper. But the question is how we could attract the population, not local, but also from globally, to make sure that this is a really good job. But after the COVID pandemic, what they suffer, you know, extensive working hours, stress, third party violence in the care homes, and it's a good example in the UK, people were dying because they don't even been given the personal protective equipment. We need to really ensure that this is the sector that people want to work and you could make a career. So I think it's it's very important to for us and for our society to focus exactly what Tiago was saying about how our society looks like and what kind of jobs we need and what kind of jobs not. Because do we really need to have a communications people like, you know, those who are putting things on Twitter or Facebook? Do we need this? Are there essential jobs or not? We need to start thinking what are essential jobs for our society because some of the jobs are not essential now. And the question the COVID pandemic showed that which jobs are essential for us to, suffer, to survive and which not. And um, being, you know, doing PR, for instance, although it's important here for colleagues, I don't know, it's really essential that's that's my short comment because i think we really need to close this uh this panel very soon right? because we are finishing yeah. yes we we are running out of time um and i still i also have two questions um in the chat but i also want to give you to the opportunity to uh, respond to mr rogalewski's question on on how we um, can make the job as as healthcare workers um, more tr attractive. If if anyone wants to add something um, to that, otherwise I I can also continue with the questions in the chat. Okay. Well, maybe I can be very brief. Right. Mm -hmm. so the first is recognize and acknowledge the outstanding work, the essential function that they perform in society and the recognition and acknowledgement that comes with decent salary, decent working conditions, now, uh, lifelong learning opportunities, the proper retirement, non-ageist uh, policies towards retirement, an age-friendly environment at the workplace. So there's a number of things that we can put in place you know, to ensure that people are retained and more than that now are happy with the work that they do and with the contribution that they provide to society. And then at later life, I have a strategic planning for people, for those willing to continue working in those positions or being involved in those positions to ensure that we don't lose that amazing assets that we have while at the same time enable people who want to take a different career to do so. Last but not least, to make sure that the informal caregivers are also protected, respected, supported, trained, and acknowledged in society, because there's a huge invisible contribution done by informal caregivers, oftentimes older women, to go back to Danielle's point, that is not necessarily acknowledged, that is not part of the economy, that is not part of uh, what society recognizes and values. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to get back to to one question in the chat, maybe very briefly, because we we actually we're already um, at the at the end of the panel. Um, it's about the generation uh, question we had before. What are some of the ways that we can bridge the generational gap between the younger and older people, so that there is a mutual understanding that aging is a process for everyone? 
I think maybe for you, uh, Mrs. Falkingham. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think actually um, Diego's put some uh, a link in the chat for that. Uh, I think that would be really, really helpful. I, I'd start off by um, putting out a challenge um, that perhaps the gap between the generations isn't quite as big as it is portrayed by the media. So it's really interesting that um, in the United Nation, in the United States, there is um, generational politics. But actually in Europe, that's not, that historically that has not been the case. So we may be divided on all sorts of lines um, uh, by income and by gender and, and, and by ethnicity, but actually by generation, we're less divided. And... Um, and most of us still live in families and we actually are exposed to the different generations through our family networks and through our social networks. Um, so I'd start off by challenging whether the generations are really as divided a, a, as we think they are. However, having said that, of course, there are, um, there are ways in which we can strengthen the, that understanding. And in order to strengthen that understanding, we have to be exposed to each other. So we have to actually have places where the generations come together outside of the family as well as inside of the family. So thinking around um, communal activities, thinking around schools and, and other places where, where the different generations can come together and actually talk to each other. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this active discussion. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I would have loved to continue uh, discussing it, uh, with you and, and talking with you. Um, yeah, if you haven't had enough yet, you're welcome to take a look at the other discussions. There's one more uh, today at 5.30 p.m. We will continue here under this link. Uh, with a panel on the topic of war and health just stay logged in or join us later under the same link um yeah and also tomorrow uh, there are four more panels thank you very much um for everyone to everyone listening and uh, especially to to the experts here in the panel um it was very interesting and uh yeah thank you and have a great day Bye-bye. Thank you. I enjoyed it a lot.